Instead of consenting to everything that God has for us, we give him some of us, but we hold on to other parts of us. God, you can have this, 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 and this, but you can't have this, 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 and this. So it's, my, it's myself. I'm looking in myself. But the problem is, the longer that we go on, it gets a little bit more difficult. <sighs> to straddle both worlds. And I want to submit to some of us today, the reason that our lives are so stressed and have so much tension is because your life literally looks like this. <laughs> My wife is the most competitive person I know. Uh, she'll turn anything competitive and she has the opportunity to do so. Um, she was a competitor when we were teenagers. Um, yesterday we were playing cards together. Anybody play hand, hand and foot? I almost said hand, foot, and mouth. <laughs> um, does anybody play hand, foot, and mouth? Uh, it's a fantastic game. Um, <laughs> we were playing yesterday and she demolished me. And I, no, I'm not gonna lie, it was one of those, I was frustrated. It was like, it was supposed to be a peaceful Sabbath and here I am just getting owned by my wife. And, uh, and so I wanted to quit after the first round. She's like, no, you have to keep on playing. And the entire rest of the game, round two and round three, she just had this sadistic smile on her face, <laughs> which was just letting me know the entire time that uh, she was destroying me. And uh, I go, go to therapy because I live with a competitive person. And so <laughs> competition's interesting. And I, I didn't know if you knew this or not, but do you know there's a competition taking place in all of our lives? Yeah. And that competition, whether we realize it or not, is being played out on the field of our identity. Now, obviously, one of the contenders in this competition is God. That's the right answer to all questions in church, right? <laughs> but you might be surprised at who the other contender is. It's ourself. It's yourself. It's myself. It's myself. And see, many of us fail to acknowledge this, which is why we struggle to answer the question of who are we? And many of us are struggling with that question today. Who are we? We're looking at all kinds of different places and spaces to find the answer to that question. We're going from relationship to relationship, job to job, experience to experience, drug to drug, explicit moment after explicit moment. We are doing everything that we can possibly do to somehow find who we are. And many of us have been convinced along the way, after none of those things have told us who we are, we came up with this idea that maybe the best place to find ourselves is within ourselves. So we started looking inward. But here's the problem with looking inward, is that you and I will never be able to find ourselves by looking in ourselves. We will never find ourselves by looking inward, yet we continue to engage in this battle. And what happens when we do, we become a contender on the field of our identity. I want to take us to a portion of scripture. It's found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. We're going to find the origins of a phrase that we're going to be exploring today. And that phrase is the Imago Dei. That's the Latin term defining the, the writings that we have in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And it means the image of God. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. It says, then God said, every shout, God said. Yes. Every shout, God said. This is important. God said, let us make man in our image. Notice nobody else said that. Now remember, I'm making the assumption that a lot of us in here believe in what the Bible says, but I am fully aware that there's many of us in here that don't. And so this might be a little bit of a, a nebulous conversation right now, but I want to encourage you to just kind of sit with us for just a moment, understand at least as, a, as an Orthodox Christian, we believe that God authored everything. And so this narrative that we find in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27 tells us, God said, let us make man in our image. In other words, we weren't formed by some large explosion. We weren't, uh, we're not just a bunch of floating amoebas around the universe that collided and all of a sudden this beautiful creation came to be. We're not happenstance. We're not this, this ethereal concept. 
What we believe is that you and I, come on somebody, have been created by Almighty God. So every shout, God said. God said. This is important for us to understand. God said, let us make man in our image, the Imago Dei, according to our likeness. What are they going to do? They're going to rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And what we see in this section of Scripture is that there is an authoritative voice, God's voice, speaking into who you and I are, defining us, shaping us, creating the framework in which your life and my life is to exist. And God doesn't care just about our behaviors, but he cares about our being. I'm going to say that one more time. God doesn't just care about our behaviors, he cares about our being. And see, a lot of us have missed the identity issue because we think God simply cares about our behaviors and we miss the fact that God cares fundamentally about who you are. Because here's the truth, behaviors flow out of our identity. Let me say it this way, we behave in congruence with what we believe about ourselves. And this is an important truth for us to recognize. It's this identity battle that's taking place. So we have this idea presented to us in Scripture that you and I are created in the image of likeness of God. It's the Imago Dei. But there's there's this other part of the equation. We define it in week one of this series that we're calling expressive individualism or the self-made self. It's this independent idea that we believe I can look within myself and inside myself I have the ability to self-define. I have the ability to come up with whatever I want to. That my life is simply a choose-your-own-adventure type of reality. It's a DIY project. But the truth is, is that position stands in stark contrast to the position of the Imago Dei. And so we see these two things battling it out. Come on, how many of you would acknowledge today that maybe you've had moments in your life where you've experienced that battle ensue? You're, you're in one moment, man, I want to live for you, God, and I want to live in line with what you have for me, the image that you've created me to be, the person that brings and images your glory. But then in another moment, I want what I want. I feel it, I think it, and because I want it, I can be it. We were watching Zootopia the other day. My wife reminded me of this. It was our Friday night movie. And the, the main theme of Zootopia is anybody can be anything. And right at the beginning of the movie, I turned to her and I said, see, there's expressive individualism. <laughs> this is why I can't watch movies because I always go for the ideological issues inside of them. Disney's rife with them. And so I sat back for the rest of the movie and I watched this thing play out and I was like, wow, this, it, it really is a picture of the world that we're living in right now. And all of us fighting to be whatever it is that we want to be, and none of us consulting with God and asking Him who He made us to be. Image bearers. Now, we're going to talk about this in subsequent messages. It may even be next week, but what does it mean to image the glory of God? That's what image bearers are supposed to do. That our, Your life and my life is, is to be a reflection of the goodness of God. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful moment in this series, but we have, to, we have to go head-to-head with this issue today. And the issue is this, is that many of us are battling back and forth between what God has for us and the framework of the Imago Dei versus the self-made self and living how I want to live. 2015, a survey was conducted and subsequently published in a book called Good Faith, Being a Christian When Society Thinks You're Irrelevant and Extreme. This is what the survey found, and I quote, of adults in the United States agreed that the best way to find yourself is to begin looking within yourself. The best way to find yourself is to begin looking within yourself. Which is an interesting idea if you think about it, but there's a problem with it. There's a fatal flaw with looking in yourself to find yourself. Writer and author Francis Fukuyama so eloquently articulates it this way when he says, The problem is that the inner selves that we are celebrating may be cruel, violent, narcissistic, or dishonest, or they may simply be lazy and shallow. What he's saying is that oftentimes when we look inside yourselves, we find something that's not very beautiful. Can we be honest today? Right? Now, I know all of us prescribe to the idea that I'm a beautiful butterfly, right? 
<laughs> We're just going to get all the Disney movies into this message today. Okay? But what we have to realize, and this is, please, 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 please don't hear this message different than you need to hear. This is not a message where I'm going to beat up on us and be like, woe is me, and we just walk around, and, and we're just, woe is me, woe is me. That's not the intent of this message today. But the intent of this message today is actually to see the beauty of ourselves in light of who we've been made to be. We've got to find ourselves imaging God, the Imago Day, Which brings us to what I believe to be one of the most confrontational and divisive and combative teachings found within the gospels from Jesus. And some of you are freaking out right now because you're like, I didn't know Jesus can be combative, confrontational, and divisive. But I wanna just suggest to you today that Jesus was actually pretty savage. Like he, wouldn't, he would cut some. He'd just be like, he'd be ninja style with some of his teaching. He'd come in and be like, wham, bam, boom. And all of a sudden people were like, wait, what just happened, right? That was Jesus's communication style. I know most of us think that he just ran around, told everybody that he loved them and gave them bread. That's so, <laughs> that's not everything that Jesus did. He said some things. Okay, so now, before we get into this next portion to, of the service today, I wanna stop because I need you to sign on the dotted line something, and it's this. Do you give me per, uh, uh, permission to be confrontational today? Some of you said no. Okay, that's fine. Um, in unison, both auditorium said, you guys give me permission to be your pastor today. Say some things, okay? Okay, so we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna dig into the interior on some stuff. Is that all right with everybody? Okay, so we're gonna look at this section of scripture of teaching, and then we're gonna, we're gonna try to uh, extract some truths from it that I think will really help us in this whole issue of these two things battling each other out. Expressive individualism, the self-made self, looking internal, or imaging God, being image bearers, the Imago Dei. Y'all with me? Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through to 39. What's interesting is that this section of teaching is so important that we actually have it captured in all four of our gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For the sake of today, we're gonna to look at Matthew, Matthew's version of it, chapter 10, verses 32 to 39. Y'all ready for this? Yeah. Therefore, everybody shout therefore. therefore. Therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before others, this is Jesus speaking. I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. All right, that sounds good. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Wait a second. That seems a bit tough, Jesus. Don't assume that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Okay, wait a second. What side of the bed did Jesus get up on today? <laughs> then he doubles down. Listen to what he says in verse 33, or 35. He says, for I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Can we just all acknowledge that's very strong words right there? Could you imagine sitting listening to that message and be like, wait a second, what are we talking about today? And then he, and then he goes even further. The one who loves a father or a mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or a daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone who finds his life will lose it, and anyone who loses his life because of me will find it. This is one of the most confrontational sections of Scripture that we have in the New Testament. It's, it's full on. It, it's front. And some of us are even battling right now in our mind because we're like, wait a second. No one's told me about this Scripture before. We've got to study this thing. We've got to look at this thing because Jesus is saying some very pointed stuff to you and I in this moment. In this discourse, write this down if you're taking notes, Jesus is laying claim to all of our lives. Every ounce of our life, every inch of our life, every hour of our life, every minute of our life, every section of our life, every part of your life, your mind, your heart, your will, your emotions, your body, your stuff, your things, every ounce of who you are, Jesus lays claim to it, if you will allow him. And these statements would stand in direct opposition to ex expressive individualism, which we see as believing that my personal happiness is the apex of life. The self-made self believes that living out my own Happiness, making sure that, that happiness is the greatest goal of my life 
It stands in stark opposition to that because Jesus requires some stuff from you and for me. Y'all with me still today? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna shape some truths out of this section of scripture. We're gonna look at what Jesus is dealing with in each of our lives uh, in, this, in this section of scripture. But I need your help today. Come on, every shot. Number one, here's the first thing that Jesus is saying. And we're gonna go verse by verse on this, all right? This is the first thing Jesus is saying. Jesus' lordship and authority in our lives is a matter of consent. Jesus' lordship and authority in our lives is a matter of consent. Watch what he says. Therefore, if anyone who will acknowledge me, or therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. In other words, you and I must choose Jesus, and we do so by consenting to his will in our life. The Greek helps us with this. The Greek word, it'll be up on the screen, means to assent, consent, admit. Commonly used in classical Greek, this is what it means. To agree with, or here it is, I love this. To consent to the desire of another. So when Jesus is saying, acknowledge me, he's saying, I want you to consent to the desires that I have for your life. Four amens. Let's try it over here on this side. We're gonna... <laughs> Jesus is saying, I want you to consent to my desires for your life, which means that you no longer get to live out yours. Ooh! Jesus, I thought you were nicer than that. And he is. Now, now Jesus is, or the Bible's gonna tell us that we have the desires of our heart, but he plans our steps. What many of us do in expressive individualism and the self-made self is I have my desires and I plan my steps. And then I tell God to get on with my agenda. But Jesus is saying, listen, you have to consent to this thing. And this is the problem with a lot of our journeys in faith is we simply think that, that following Jesus is believing him like Santa Claus, not consenting to his will and desire for our life. And it's why many of us can acknowledge Jesus and not be changed by him. Am I in anybody's neighborhood today? <laughs> See, when we follow Jesus, we consent to conform to his desires for our lives and, and, and abandon ours. And this is contrary to the self-made self, me looking inside of me where I, if I feel it, if I think it, if I want it, I can do it. It's very, it's very different. See, Expressive individualism, the self-made self, sees our personal autonomy and happiness as the highest good. Following Jesus means I stand in submission to his desire and his ultimate good. First Kings chapter 18. I want to take us there. First Kings chapter 18, verses 20 through to 21. This is a moment in scripture just before this famous conflict between Elijah and the prophets of Baal and all of Israel is gonna be summoned. They're gonna be standing around. All of these prophets, King Ahab, Elijah, they're all gonna be standing there. And then Elijah is gonna ask this question. I want us, I want us to look at this because this is a very profound question I think one all of us need to wrestle with today. And it says this in verse 20. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and gathered all the prophets at Mount Carmel. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, here it is. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people didn't answer him a word. They were silent. They were caught. Have you ever been caught in the middle of a question before? You're like, oh, I didn't think that question was coming at me. That, that's what's happening right now. They're like, whoa, wait, wait, I don't know what to say. And, and, and you know, what's interesting about this moment is that all those who were standing before Elijah they didn't want to answer him. And, and here's why I believe they didn't want to answer him. Because all the people were standing there waiting to watch the battle between the false prophets of Baal and Elijah, the representative of God. Because oftentimes we wait to see who's going to give us a greater degree of what we want before we make a decision. Maybe another way to say it is like this. We have a tendency to profess allegiance to the thing that gratifies our desires the fastest. But here's the thing, God desires our allegiance before anything. See, it's, God's not transactional and he's not saying like, if you come to me, then I'll give you this. Come on, it's getting quiet in church today. 
But that's how many of us approach God. We come to God and we think, oh, well, if I come to God, then he's gonna give me this, 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 and this. And so we make a decision to follow Jesus because we think that he's gonna gratify certain desires in our life. But here's the thing about following Jesus. We follow Jesus not because he gratifies desires. We follow Jesus because he is God. <laughs> and this is what I'm trying to, this is, this is why I said this is gonna be a confrontational message because some of us need to get to the place. I follow Jesus because he alone is the only one who can claim that he lived, died, rose again and ascended to the right hand of God and is coming back one day. I follow him because he is the great I am. I follow him because he is the great grave breaker. I follow him because he is the one who did what he said he would do. So I follow him and the premise of my following is because he said who he is and he proved who he is. Not because I simply get what I want from him. Because here's what's frustrating. How many of us have said yes to God and then we didn't get what we think we were gonna get? And then we get frustrated at God. I thought you were gonna give me all the things I ever wanted and Sting was gonna be playing in the background and I was gonna be running through fields of gold. See, I'm just, I'm trying to keep it real with us on this one because one of the greatest ways that I see this play out is when we face suffering, we reject God. Why? Because suffering is counter to what we believe God is supposed to give us. Come on, somebody. Talk to me here. Isn't it? There's something in our framework that doesn't believe that suffering should be allowed in my life because of this. And I haven't said any of this in the second series, uh, in the, any of the other services. I'm trying to just follow the spirit on some of this stuff. But I, wanna, I want us to see, I'm belaboring this point because it's probably the most important one. And if we don't get to any of the other points, then great, fantastic. Um, but what I want us to see today is what it looks like to be a person who tries to straddle two worlds. And this is where some of us are at in life. And we start, and it is part of the journey. Some of us today, we're going to say yes to Jesus. I brought my stretchy pants today. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but what we do in this journey of, of formation is for a lot of us, instead of consenting to everything that God has for us, we give him some of us, but we hold on to other parts of us. God, you can have this, 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 and this, but you can't have this, 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 and this. So it's my, it's myself. I'm looking in myself. But the problem is the longer that we go on, it gets a little bit more difficult. <sighs> to straddle both worlds. And I want to submit to some of us today, the reason that our lives are so stressed and have so much tension is because your life literally looks like this. <laughs> Is this, is this helping anybody out right now? <laughs> is this not helping me? Um, but this is what we're trying to do. But what Jesus is saying is, listen, if you want to follow me, you have to give me everything. You have to, get, you have to give me everything. Or don't. But you can't, like Elijah say, you can't go between two opinions. I told you this is gonna be a confrontational message because some of us right now, this is, this is where we are at. You're like, oh, but I love this stuff so much. <laughs> I'm looking inside of me and, and I'm finding all the things that I care about. And, and, and we're gonna talk about this in, in a few moments, but there's certain things in our life that we hold up higher than God. But Jesus, in his confrontational way, says, and I'm not just doing this so that I can go back and forth between ladders and it look cool on Instagram. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> I need some of us to see this because you're wondering what is going on. Why am, why am I fighting so much of my identity? And it's because you're going back and forth all the time. Can I, can I just tell you how exhausting this is? Can you see how tiring this would be? Some of you are so weary at night because you've been doing this all day long. 
And some of you are really trying to like stretch it. I can't do it because I'm not Sean claude Van Damme. <laughs> but Jesus is saying, hey, when, when are you, you going to make a choice? When are you going to choose to give me everything? God's great purpose for our life is not to give us everything we want. It's to help us become everything he's created us to be. And this is a sobering reality for some of us. I'm gonna skip point two for the sake of time here. I wanna take us to point three because I think this is really important. It's where there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of tension today with the time that I have. Is that all right with everybody? I just messed up the A-type personalities in the room. You're like, you can't do that. I just lost some of you. It's my message. I can do what I want. Um, so we're skipping point two. We're going to go to point three uh, for the team in the back as well. Uh, here's, this, here's the second thing that I want to I deal with today is that secondary markers are not primary makers. Secondary markers are not primary makers. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, he goes on to say, the one who loves a father or a mother more than me is not worthy of me. Listen to these words that Jesus says. The one who loves a son or a daughter more than me is not worthy of me. How many of you would say that's pretty offensive? Like, really, Jesus? Whoever loves a mother or a father more than you is not worthy of me? You mean I can't love my kids more than you? And the answer to that question would be, yep, that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. In the context of the scripture, that's what he's saying. Now, for some of us, that is, ac- like, is mind-blowingly offensive because of this issue right here. Secondary markers are not primary makers. What I mean by this is captured in the question that all of us need to consider today. Someone needs to write this question down. What makes me me? What makes me me? What defines me? The answer to these questions, according to one author, are the foundations upon which we will build our identity. Now, there are collective markers in all of our lives that across sociology, anthropology, anthropology, biology, psychology, and theology, these markers remain true in all of these, and we would define them as second markers as to who you and I are as human beings. I'm going to put them up on the screen so we can see them. Here's where we're going to get a little academic. Is that all right with everybody? Okay. Okay. Broadly speaking, these are the things that make that you and I have a tendency to self-define from. These is, is no order of importance. They're just down, down the chute, okay? Race, ethnicity, nationality, culture, gender and sexuality, physical and mental capacity, family of origin, age, relationships, relational status, occupation, possessions, personality, and character. Those are many of the things that we allow to define us. But across all of these things, theology would tell us, the Bible would tell us that these are secondary markers, not primary makers. What do I mean by that? None of these things have the authority to tell you who you are. They represent the beauty secondary to who God has created you, come on somebody, to be. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at it like this. Uh, Let's take age, for instance. Some of us in here today can be like, well... I'm at the end of my life. I'm in the older ages and stages of my life. So there must not be any more purpose for me. But God would tell us, as long as there is breath in your lungs, you still have a purpose and a plan. Come on, somebody. You still got some stuff to do. But when you believe that, what you're saying is that age defines you. Let's take relationships and relational status. We do this in church a lot. It's the war between singles and married people, right? And so we've got a lot of singles thinking that their relational status defines them and their worth. No, it's a secondary marker. It doesn't define you. It's a part of your makeup, but it's not the defining authority of your makeup. Why? Because God tells you who you are. So just because there's not a significant other in your life doesn't mean that you are not important, don't have a purpose, don't have a plan, don't have a reason, don't have a rhyme. Y'all see what I'm talking about? 
And so a lot of singles are running around just waiting to do life until they get somebody. And we're trying to let you know that the Bible tells us that you have so much life for you right now, regardless of your relational status. But the married people, <laughs> you thought you were gonna get off the hook. When we make our marriage or our relationships the primary definer of our lives, you and I will try to extract from our spouses something that they cannot give us that only God can, identity. So ladies, we run around like, he needs to tell me who I am. Tell me who I am. Tell me who I am. Guys, we run around. She needs to tell me who I am, who I am, who I am. Did I, and I can say this because we talk this way all the time with each other. Erica does not define me. She doesn't want to. She doesn't have that authority. She doesn't have that power. Our marriage doesn't define me. It's a part of who I am, but it's not the primary of who I am. The primary is, is I am an image bearer of God. Oh, come on, somebody. We gotta realize this. And when we get a hold of this into our soul, it changes everything. I'm an image bearer first, and then all of these other things bring expression to that image bearing. But what happens is, is that we get it twisted because we make it a primary identifier, and then no wonder we believe that our physical and mental capacity, our gender and our sexuality, our culture, all of these things that we see up here define us. Am I talking about any in church today? And that's what's going on in the world right now is that these have become primary markers instead of secondary markers submitted to the greater image that I have in Christ Jesus. This is an incredibly important distinction to make. So this is why Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 to 29, he says, For those of you who were baptized in Christ, you have been clothed with Christ. Come on, somebody. You've been clothed with Christ. So therefore, there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. So let's go back to what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, hey, listen, whoever, um, let's go back to the, the section of scripture. He says, hey, where's my section of scripture? There it is. The one who loves her, his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more is not worthy of me. Jesus isn't saying don't love people. He's saying, you can't love anything else more than me. That's strong. In other words, I can't love my wife more than I love Jesus. And how many of you know that if I love her more than I love Jesus, we're gonna have some frustration in our marriage. Y'all see what this is about? The greatest good that you will be able to give people is when you love Jesus over everything. Oh, I, know, I hope you guys are getting this. The, the, the greatest position you can be in, husbands, can I talk to you? If you love Jesus over everything, then you will love everything appropriately. I'm the best husband I can be when I'm submitted to Jesus first, when I love him more than everything. I'm the best father I can put it in this way if this helps you out. I've got to love Jesus more than I love this church. I've got to love Jesus more than I love you. And I do. <laughs> Why? Because I'm the best pastor I can be when I love him the most. And so some of us are living in these things. Now, I want to say this about these secondary markers. And like I said, these are the two points that I'm trying to belabor the most because they're, they're, they're so important in this conversation is that when I, let's go back up to that, um, that list, guys. When I try to extract, someone needs to hear this and write this down today. When I try to extract identity from these things, I'm trying to take something from them that they have no authority and power to give. And how many of you know that when you try to take something out of something that doesn't have that thing to give, you end up destroying that something? 
So what can happen? Let, let, let's take family of origin or let, let's talk about what Jesus said. When I try to take and receive identity from my children, I actually am trying to pull something out of them that they do not have the power to give me and it ends up hurting them more than helping them. But when I receive my identity from Jesus as the Imago Dei, then I receive from him and I input into them. You see the difference? But what many of us are doing is we're trying to receive from all of these things and we're hurting them because they do not have the power to define you. Only God, according to scripture, has the ability to define you. At the end of the day, in Jesus' mighty name. So when Paul says there's neither Jew or Greek, slave nor free, male and female, since you're all one in Christ Jesus, is he getting rid of all those things? Is he saying none of those things exist? No, that's not what he's saying. He's just saying that they're secondary to everything. You're clothed in Christ. You have a new identity in Jesus. You're clothed differently. It's identity. Number four, last one's this. Technically, it's three since I skipped a point. This is why some of you are gonna freak out. (laughs) The last one's this. Crucified lives are complete lives. Crucified lives are complete lives. Matthew chapter 10, 38 through 39 says this. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone who finds his life, in other words, what it's saying is anyone who tries to find his life by looking inward and searching all over, anybody who finds his life will lose it. But anyone who loses his life because of me will find it. What I'm suggesting to all of us today as brash as it may sound to our common culture, is that everything that you look, you're looking for is found in Jesus. Amen. I legitimately believe that. Amen. Now, I, I know, I know for a lot of us in a mixed room like this, there's so many of us here today that you're like, you're kicking the tires on faith, you're trying to figure things out, and I'm speaking in very black and white terms. And I'm, I'm trying to help some of us out today in that. I know there's a lot of what about this and what about that and what about this and what about that. And I, and I get that, that, those, that you may be wrestling through those things, but I would still come back all the way around to you if I can just be conversational for a second and say, hey, listen, I fundamentally believe that everything that you are looking for is found in Christ Jesus. Everything. It may not be everything you want, but it's everything you need. The great theologian Bono <laughs> did this route. And then he, all to- he told us all, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Beautiful song. It resonated with generations even still today because it's how many of us see life. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I'm just telling you, I haven't gotten everything I want, but I found everything I'm looking for. Everything. A sense of peace, a sense of hope, a sense of continuity. A sense of joy. I know what it's like to live in this space. And this is why, oh God, renew in me a right spirit. Church, I'm telling you, from what I know about scripture, this place right here is the most secure place you and I can live, you and I can be, and, and we're gonna talk in this series. This is gonna impact all of those markers because I know how some of us are thinking right now as you look at some of those. Well, what do they think about this and what do we think about this? Oh, don't worry, we'll answer those questions. We're week three into a 16 week series or whatever it is. We're gonna unpack all those things but we're trying to build the foundation right now. It's in Jesus, the crucified life. The life where I say it's no longer I who live, Come on, somebody, but Christ who lives in me. In Jesus' mighty name, come on, and the church said, amen.
I'm gonna ask everybody to bow your head and close your eyes in this moment. The crucified life is the complete life. You know, salvation, at the end of the day, a decision to follow Jesus, it's when he says, you pick up a cross and follow me. What you're saying is I'm crucifying myself and I wanna align my life with the Imago Dei, the image of God. We do that by saying yes to Jesus, by professing, by acknowledging him, as he just said, before others, by saying, God, I'm giving you my life. And the way that we do that around here is just a, is a prayer. It's a simple prayer. There's nothing special in these words, but rather the heart from which these words come today. So with confidence, with expectation, with faith today, I'm gonna ask everybody to pray this prayer with me today. But there may be some of us in the room today that would say, man, this is me. I'm saying yes to Jesus today. Make this your prayer. Come on, as loud as we can. Would everybody in both of our rooms say, repeat these words after me. Everybody say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my past. I'm giving you my right now. Put my future in your hands. Save me. Change me. Make me new. And I declare in this moment that I'm gonna follow you all the days of my life. I'm sorry for doing it my way. And today, I am deciding to follow your way. In Jesus' mighty name.